Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, De-Silo Your Disparate IT Systems Around the Patient with VNA. It's brought to you by Lexmark. I'm Lori from HIS Talk and I will be moderating. I have a few quick housekeeping items to make you aware of before we get started. Attendee phone lines have been muted to prevent background noise. You can use GoToWebinar's questions box in the console to submit questions to our presenters at any time. The presenters will answer your questions during Q&A at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll receive links to the recording as well as the PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation in a follow-up email. We have two speakers today. Our first speaker will be Stephen Campbell. Stephen is the Manager of Diagnostic Applications and Interfaces for Piedmont Healthcare. Joining Stephen will be Larry Sitka. Larry is a VNA evangelist who is responsible for enterprise architecture and sales at Lexmark. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Stephen. Great. Thank you, Lori. So uh, the topics for today uh, will be uh, what is a VNA? So we're going to define what a VNA actually is. Uh, next, we're going to go through why you would choose a VNA. Uh, different for every environment, but we have a few items to go over for why you would choose it. Next is the actual criteria that you should use when choosing a VNA. Uh, next is the utilization of the VNA. So how do you use it in your environment? Uh, we're going to go over how Piedmont Healthcare currently uses it some future plans that we have for it, as well as uh, some, some high-level plans uh, two to three years down the road for how we intend to use it as well. Uh, then Larry's going to do a presentation uh, on an expansion of the VNA, and then we'll end with uh, questions from the, from the audience. So just a little bit about Piedmont Healthcare. Uh, we are a five-hospital healthcare system uh, with one pending acquisition, so we will be six hospitals soon. Uh, we have over 100 physician and specialist offices. Uh, we perform a, a large amount of surgeries and uh, deliveries for babies, as well as outpatient encounters. And as of note uh, is uh, our current volume of imaging studies. Uh, we currently have 1.2 million imaging studies across the various ologies. Um, and of course, this is for imaging uh, studies that we know of today. We'll go over a little bit some of those areas that you may not even realize in your environment that you have imaging being performed. So first off, what is a VNA? Um, so this term, uh, vendor neutral archive, uh, has been out in the environment for a while, and sometimes that vendor neutral portion can be confusing. Uh, some people look at this system as just a PAX uh, archive. You know, it's just a storage platform. Some people see it more as an enterprise imaging library or a clinical repository, uh, sometimes even just a multimedia exchange platform. So this definition here is really one that I like, which is a VNA is really a medical imaging platform in which images, documents, and other unstructured media types of clinical relevance, that's important, are stored in a standardized format, indexed in a patient-centric context, and made available for retrieval by other systems using industry standard interfaces. So that piece is really important too, being able to retrieve that in a non-proprietary format. So next question would be, why would you choose a VNA? Um, a lot of people see a VNA as uh, potentially just an additional cost. You know, why do I need this? It's, it's, we already have a PAC system. I already have a document management system. Uh, possibly even attached to my EHR. Um, if, if you're like Piedmont Healthcare, your environment may look a lot like ours did previously. Uh, we had a, a radiology system and we had a viewer attached to the EHR. Um, that viewer was very, very difficult to deploy. We had to actually manually install uh, clients on workstations for it to be viewed. Um, our cardiology world actually had no viewer attached to the EHR. Um, and we had meaningful use implications coming up where we needed to uh, uh, image enable our EMR across the board and, and did not have that available. Um, and then the, kind of the third layer is uh, what I'd lovingly like to call the island of misfit images. So it's those other ologies out there where you, know, you may not actually have those tied to your EHR today. Uh, wound care images, pathology, endoscopy. We'll go over a few more uh, areas in a little bit that you may not realize. Uh, but this was sort of our environment that we were in. And as we started looking at it, especially around that meaningful use implication of image enabling the EMR, 
we started realizing we could really get into an issue here where, yeah, we could throw another viewer on top of it and, and tie cardiology in, and at some point we could tie wound care probably with another system that we tie to it as well, but at some point we're going to start having viewer after viewer attached to our system and really having to pull from all of these disparate environments. Um, so as we started looking into it, Piedmont realized, you know, we really need to look at a different platform for this. Um, and like I said, we, we started seeing all of those ologies and all the imaging that's out there in the environment that we weren't even thinking about originally. Um, there's dermatology, uh, like I said, wound care and pathology. Even if something as simple as a physician in a practice, say your family physician, receiving a patient, wanting to take a, a picture of that rash so they can send it over to uh, a dermatologist specialist for consultation, um, in your environment today, that may be happening without you even realizing. Hopefully it's being done securely. In a lot of instances, it's not. Um, and we want to be able to tie that together again to a patient-centric context where that's available for any clinician uh, that wants to be able to access those images. So as we started looking at this, we really realized that we needed a platform to, to tie all of that together. And so that's where we really realized that a vendor neutral archive could do that for us. Um, as you can see in this image, and I love this, this sort of shows high level all of the different areas that you really can tie unstructured data, um, everything from the, the common uh, radiology, cardiology, like we said, all the way out there to the extreme of videos for patient education, for um, the videos during endoscopy cases or during surgical cases being able to store that so that it's now accessible and viewable uh, to clinicians by that patient-centric context. So your next question might be, um, why, uh, why choose a VNA specifically around those areas? So um, one of the areas that it really helps with is removing that reliance on, uh, on your PACS vendor. Um, that vendor neutral piece is really important and was important to Piedmont Healthcare. Uh, it's now provided a foundation for us being able to move to another PAC system very easily. Um, we're nearly finished with um, uh, migrating uh, some of our, our larger study sets, and we're still working on migrating the rest. But once we have all of that in a centralized environment where we control the images, um, now we can move to another PAC vendor if need be or to the next platform and be able to more easily uh, move there without having to go through very costly and large uh, migration. Um, second piece, of course, is to that same point is actually reducing the cost of image migration. Um, if, you're, uh, if your healthcare system is like ours, um, you probably go through uh, acquisitions, uh, quite a few, and we go through a lot of practice acquisitions here, and, and those practices come with uh, legacy PAC systems. Um, sometimes they have no PAC system at all, and it's actually just sitting on the modality still. And uh, th there's always cost behind that because we have to engage not only the RPAX vendor to uh, send those images over, but also the PAC vendor that it's coming from. The beauty of having a vendor neutral archive is now you have the control and the tools to be able to do that self if you so choose. Um, if, you're, if you're choosing a VNA vendor, you want one that you can also partner with for those much more complicated um, instances where you have larger data sets to migrate. And you may want to engage them for that. But for the smaller practice-based ones, um, you're able to now do that yourself uh, with the right tools. And again, not all VNAs offer that availability, so you really want to look for the right VNA vendor that provides that, that flexibility of using their tools. Um, next is uh, the ability to establish a platform for image routing and exchange. So now we can send images um, anywhere that we need to, uh, whether it's an image exchange platform, other PAC systems, we can route it based on logic that we are now able to control uh, with various rules within the system. It provides a scalable infrastructure for potential storage settings. Uh, your PAC system may do a very, very good job at compressing images, but if not, it does provide that ability for you to compress images further um, saving space, but also allows you to have different tiers of storage. Um, so we are actually in the process right now of looking at uh, when we finish our migration of our largest PAC system, which is uh, well over 10 years of data, there's no need to have all 10 years sitting on high cost, uh, fast spinning disk. Now we can move a certain portion off of it 
um, automatically as part of uh, life cycle management rules that we set up off to whatever lower cost, uh, slower storage where those studies may not be retrieved as often. And again, that speaks to number five, which is having life cycle management. Being able to create those rules that you can uh, decide where your data is stored, when it's stored, whether or not you even want to purge it. Um, being able to determine based on your state's uh, regulatory rules that if, uh, if it's no longer needed after seven years, ten years, whatever it is, that you finally have an opportunity to purge that data. So your next question would be, how do I know what the right VNA is? So it's different for every organization, um, but here's some, some things to look at when you're really wanting to choose a VNA that's right for you. Um, first thing you want to make sure of is that it can meet your immediate needs, but that can also expand to other ologies. You don't want to lock yourself into uh, perhaps a, a PAC specific VNA where it only can do DICOM images. You want to make sure it has the flexibility uh, to do visible light images, videos, whatever it is out there, uh, to be able to store those and not have to have it be DICOM specific, because not every platform out there is going to have that option. Um, next piece is a decision on whether or not to be PACS independent. For Piedmont Healthcare in particular, that was a very important decision to us. We did not want to be tied uh, to our PACS vendors with that vendor neutral archive. We wanted that to be separate so that we had that control factor over our images and, and how we use them. Um, next piece for, for us that was important was market leadership. Um, when you're choosing a product, um, you, you always want to make sure that you choose something that has been out there for a while um, and has a large customer base where uh, issues with the system have already been worked out. Um, because we were wanting to be PAX independent, not, not purchase one from a PAX vendor, um, it was very important for us to look at this as well. And Accuo was uh, and, it, and is uh, one of the top leaders for a VNA independent uh, system or PAX independent VNA vendor. Um, next was the federation of the data. So it's really important for you to make sure that your data is logically separated but it's not siloed from each other. So in other words, uh, when you're storing to various repositories, um, your VNA should have the ability for you to set up how you want that data pulled. If I'm, for instance, for our EMR, we allow the EMR to pull from um, almost all of our repositories. But there are certain repositories that we've set aside that have what we consider junk data or research data in it, where we're able to segregate that one when we want to and, and by our choice um, and be and only able to uh, pull those via other mechanisms besides the EMR. And a VNA should have the option for you to choose those boundaries, but not uh, require it uh, when you're setting up your various repositories. Uh, the next piece is making sure that your uh, your enterprise platform can handle unstructured imaging data across the continuum. So for um, us in particular, it was uh, good that we already had a document management system that was also owned by a Lexmark Perceptive. And uh, the integration of that with the VNA as we move forward will be a very tight integration. But um, a good VNA should be able to store documents from a document management system and, and have that capable for any uh, vendor that's out there. So you really want to look at it uh, in that context. It's not just, again, your cardiology, radiology images. It's documents that you may have in your document management system and how you want to tie that again to your patient-centered context. Um, the other piece is being able to categorize those images across uh, the various image types. So to the right is an image of um, what we're looking at with uh, Lexmark, which is their perceptive desktop, um, that allows us to open up Epic and this uh, view in context for a patient so that uh, it's very easy to sort and see um, the various unstructured data that's available to the clinician, and now they have an ability to quickly pull that data. Uh, we're not live with that yet, but it's something we're continuing to work on right now. The next piece is um, making sure that you're, you have a universal viewer that's capable of pulling imaging uh, data correctly uh, and linked to your EMR. So uh, for, for us, Lexmark at the time didn't have a universal viewer, but you want to make sure the universal viewer that you select 
uh, to sit on top of your VNA um, is able to communicate with the right protocols, um, that it's not just DICOM only, that you have expansion to new protocols like uh, WADO or MINT, um, other image transfer protocols, um, so that you can get the, that image data um, quickly and efficiently as well. So this is our current state that we have for our VNA. Um, right now we have our modalities storing to our PAC system and our cardiology PAC system still. Uh, it, it does route it to the VNA layer and the VNA layer uh, stores it to, right now we have uh, NAS storage and SAN storage that it's currently storing to. Um, but we, again, we do have that ability in the future to then route it off to a cloud storage. Um, we're determining right now what that time frame should be, uh, but it may be studies older than three years, um, since those will not be pulled as often, um, that we're now able to store that to the cloud or to some other layer of lower cost storage um, and put in rule sets so that as orders uh, come into the environment for a patient that's now been seen again and hasn't been for a while, uh, we can still pull that across and, and pre-cache that on the higher uh, efficiency disk. Um, we also have an enterprise viewer, like I said, tied to our EPIC uh, EMR. We are an EPIC shop here. Um, it pulls directly from the VNA for any images. Um, if it's not locally stored in the cache, then it does a call to the VNA layer to pull that image across and show it to the clinician. Um, we also have uh, archiving set up so that uh, retrieval can be done from our PAC systems. Um, we are not fully live with that across all of our PAC systems, but um, we are continuing to work on that piece. And uh, as, as older studies are pulled, it will pull from the ACCO archive um, straight into the PAC system. And again, if you, when you're looking for a VNA, you want to not just have it be um, on-demand uh, pulls, but also have that ability to uh, route images based upon orders or even appointments that come in uh, being able to pre-cache that data where necessary. Uh, we also have an image exchange environment. Um, so we have uh, outside parties that um, are sending to our um, iShare platform, our image exchange platform, and that is then routed and uh, sent to our VNA. Um, one of those components that's really important to us is we are uh, working through the strategy of receiving research studies uh, for various programs. So now we have the ability for those outside parties to send through our image exchange platform and store to a specific repository for research. Um, now that data is segregated because we want it to be segregated, not because the system demands it, but it's also not lumped into our PAC system uh, where it's available and viewed by um, everybody else using the PAC system. Now we're able to segregate that data fully. And some of our, our future plans that we have for um, expansion of our, our VNA um, is to be able to utilize it for direct capture of images. So like I said before, uh, one of the areas in particular that uh, is problematic for us is our family practice physicians. We, we do have instances where those physicians have taken images, um, say, like I said, a rash of a, of a patient, and actually texted it uh, potentially over to um, other people, uh, to other physicians for consultation purposes. Um, that data has got to be secured um, it, whenever you're doing any kind of image transfers, but also secured from a storage perspective so it can be, re be retrieved later. So we're looking with uh, Epic at Haiku and Kanto. Um, currently, uh, they do not have the option to store uh, to a VNA, but it is one of the enhancements they are that we are working with Epic on. Um, so that we can directly capture that from the application, store it through EPIC to the VNA, and be able to retrieve that back. Uh, another area that we're working on is uh, EndoWorks, being able to integrate the uh, not only the still captures from our endoscopy studies, but also those videos, uh, being able to have that video processed and uh, by HL7 sent across to the VNA, which will then pull it and store it in context to that patient. And then the last one is really an area that's um, difficult for a lot of healthcare systems, and um, we're, we're just beginning in the stages of looking at digital pathology. Um, those are very, very large data sets, 
and become very problematic for healthcare institutions uh, to deal with. So one of the nice things about having a VNA is that you now have the ability to, again, with your, your life cycle management tool, decide how you want to manage that data and delete it. Um, as we move forward with digital pathology, uh, we know that we're not at this time going to be able to store all of those images uh, for years and years. Instead, uh, we are able to store it to the VNA, serve it, and route it to uh, where it needs to go to, um, and delete it from the VNA when it's appropriate. Um, so that's another nice piece here is you start having larger data sets that you can't store, you're still able to use the VNA not as a storage platform, but as a routing platform. And then one of the, the big pieces that we're trying to look for with, with our VNA is um, that idea of life without PACS or cardiology PACS system. Um, and, and this is something you may hear in the environment as uh, disassociated PACS or um, de decoupled PACS. Um, in our environment, we're calling it just DPACS. You know, you have a CPACS and an RPACS. Uh, this is our DPACS system that we're looking at. And it's really taking the concept of a PACS system and splitting it up into its various components. So one of the areas, obviously, for a PAC system is that ingestion of images and storage of images. So that is the VNA layer that we have um, in place now. So now we have our foundation for splitting off that component of our PAC system. Um, we already are actually uh, working through storage of our modalities uh, to the VNA. Um, and in the interim period, we would be routing it to our PAC system. Uh, but in the future, um, as we'll show in a second, that's not necessary. Um, and then uh, the second piece of a, of a PAC system is being able to replace that reading work list, your, um, maybe your documentation component of if you have a CPAC system, uh, being able to replace that structured reporting, uh, being able to have your reading work list. So we're looking in our environment at using EPIC for that. Um, so we're able to now have a reading work list out of EPIC, uh, with our uh, Cupid uh, implementation for cardiology, we can replace the documentation and structured reporting side of cardiology um, to be able to do that within the system. And we're actually already using our EPIC environment for a DICOM modality work list. So the majority of our cardiology systems already pull their work list from EPIC, and we are continuing to roll out um, changing those for our radiology modalities as well. And then that, that third component that you have out there is the viewer now. So that's the piece of a PAC system that, to me, is the most often um, that is changing in our, in our environment today. The new algorithms come out, uh, new viewing technologies, smarter ways to hang protocols. All of those pieces are really the meat of um, what is changing in a PAC system today. Um, stru uh, structured reports and, and how data comes in in that method really hasn't changed in the past 10 years much. Same thing for your ingestion of your images. That hasn't changed much. It's that viewer technology that really consistently changes year after year uh, with new advances. So by decoupling this entire environment and now having a viewer um, that's separate from the PAC system and having it um, be able to be open in context with your EMR, you've now built a PAC system that allows you to leverage all those technologies together, but at the same time as the technology moves forward and new viewer technologies come out um, in a particular area, you now have the option to more easily tack on, say, another viewer um, while your enterprise viewer may not be ready for that newest advanced technology, you can plug in another one for that purpose um, in, in a temporary state and not have to build out a whole new PAC system, not have to do a migration of studies. It allows you that flexibility of moving and matching the viewers that you need for your particular purposes. And then, like I said, the um, direct migration and, and acquisition of different uh, practices being able to migrate those ourselves um, into the environment is another great tool. Um, but you don't always have the options with your, uh, your acquisitions to be able to migrate those before those are needed. So another piece with the VNA that we're looking at actually with our newest acquisition um, is the ability for us to pull on demand, uh, meaning that once we have set up in the VNA that the patient is known as 
um, one MRN number in the other hospital's PAC system and the MRN in ours, we now have the ability to say as that patient comes into one of our Piedmont environments that's not the newest hospital, it can automatically have the VNA pull and query from the uh, other PAC system and pull it into the VNA on demand and make it accessible to our clinicians. So again, that's one of the other very, very exciting things for us to be able to move forward with. So at this point, I will uh, move over to uh, Larry Sitka, who will go over um, some of the uh, expanded abilities of a VNA. Thank you, Stephen. First and foremost, I want to, uh, uh, if you could, next, please. I want to discuss what's beyond VNA. What's the next step? Uh, I truly believe there's an organization called ONC that actually is defining something that is being called a learning health system. Today, today we're in a pretty much a healthcare procedure-based type of environment from, from a vendor and from a provider standpoint. Tomorrow, we're moving into what, what we would call a health system that needs to be proactive and be able to go out and acquire information. The contention that we have is when we go to what we provide today inside the Lexmark VNA, we do provide that foundation of that learning health system defined or inside the ONC document. So in other words, the ability to acquire, send, and canonicalize. What I mean by that is the ability to take data from, from a source, create a standard data model of it sitting on the disk, not necessarily to us, to the VNA vendor, but more importantly to the site. Once you have information that's been standardized, you can now start up to any application now or into the future into their known state or their required state. This also provides a means for giving a, a perceived centralization, centralization of both storage and the application pieces more importantly, giving ownership of the data back to the organization and taking it out of the, the actual vendor's hands. So be, in other words, a VNA vendor should, if they're really a VNA, they should provide abstraction from themselves. So next, please. So what we bring forth inside our existing VNA, and these are taken pretty much directly right out of that ONC uh, um, architecture document, the ability to provide the interoperability and interoperability not only inside ourself but throughout the image exchanges that exist in the network and be able to provide open IHE private network access and the ability to acquire and dip into um, unaffiliated healthcare organizations so that you can discover patient information in real time and on the fly. Next please. So the industry drivers that are really causing this new, shall I say, solo-based platform that allows for open access and auto discovery is you all know the drivers. You all know the documents that you're storing today. Next, please. And inside of those documents today, those documents are all being requested by human beings. What a learning health system actually does, it's real-time healthcare. It provides a means for accessing information, not just on demand. Next, please but also as these analytics applications are starting to grow, the only way to actually prove an outcome of a patient or a patient population is through analytics. And the only way to support such um, requirements for information is, is through a learning health system. Next, please. So if you look at your before today, this is kind of what I would call the journey beyond VNA, journey to a learning health system. You have your traditional ologies, very departmental, very limited, very siloed. More importantly, I want to mention uh, something that is now before Congress um, called vendor lock and vendor block. If you have one of the, the hardest points or hardest problems or hardest issues of creating a VNA is getting information out of those existing storage, storage subsystems or, or PAC vendors. Sometimes they just absolutely refuse to let you have the data or when they do let you have the data, they now they allow you to dribble it out in extremely slow fashion. Unfortunately, this is a problem that occurs at every single site we go to. We've written utilities that allow us to extract the information out, but now more importantly, uh, ONC has actually given us the ability to, in a report to Congress and through a legislation that's passing, 
uh, it's passed the House already. It's called the 21st uh, Century Cure Act. That act actually defines vendor lock and vendor block, and more importantly, it puts teeth into what happens when a vendor does block healthcare information. This we see, and again, the benefit of providing uh, or using a VNA is to, uh, to minimize the cost of those migrations. Those migrations, you, next slide please, those migrations won't actually go away. You'll actually see the, the physics of those um, problems remain. So in other words, the disk to disk migration, the application to application migration, and the dirty little secret that I call the data tech refresh where you have data that's so old in order to post any new application, you have to bring it up to date. Next slide please. What that does is it now creates a single view of the patient information all coalesced into one common location and then provides an existing PHI uh, protection layer. So today's environment and why you have this vendor lock and vendor block type of information is you have existing applications that have proprietary file access. Next slide, please. And inside the proprietary file access, it all provides custom-based interfaces. And those custom interfaces, if you move the disk, you break the app. If you move the application, the, the data on disk has no relevancy. Unfortunately, we've moved that same direct proprietary file-based or uh, file access interface right into this, this thing we call an EMR. Thus, we've propagated the problem and the issue and created a migration problem ourselves. So thus creating much more another scenario of vendor lock and vendor block. Next slide. So what we provide in a learning health system and inside of what we call healthcare content management is if you have your existing PACs, your existing ECM, or you know, either cardiology PACs or radiology PACs, next slide, we provide a service that slips in between the environments, meaning separating your storage uh, infrastructure from the existing applications. We provide a generic standards-based interface for either DICOM traffic or non-DICOM traffic. More importantly, now we provide, next slide please, a SOA-based interface that allows us to actually act as a brokering service for the infrastructure, even for big data app analytics and applications. So we've taken the, the, the VNA technology and the ECM technology, combined them into one, We've provided a, a migration utility for extracting DICOM information out of those PAC systems. We now have something very similar that allows us to take other content and inject it into an XDS registry repository. Next, please. This then wraps around with an existing secure access for PHI protection. In other words, creating this new layer that sits in between storage and access for storage, access for the information so that we can secure or secure in a more efficient manner uh, the PHI. Also providing open image exchange access that sits on top and then of course PIX management services as something that we've currently released. Next please. If you look at this mess, right, if you simplify it and look at it as what we provide inside of Lexmark Healthcare, uh, there's three components. Uh, of course, the infrastructure, the SOA bus, the other content-based applications, and now the enterprise class diagnostic viewer. Next slide. And with that, Lori, I will turn it back to you. And I'll... Okay, thanks, Larry. Um, now we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. And as a reminder, please use the questions section in the GoToWebinar panel to submit your questions. The first question um, looks like it's for Stephen. What were the biggest hurdles or constraints that you faced in implementing this project? So one of the, the um, biggest issues that we ran into from the beginning was actually uh, getting our, our PAC vendors themselves being able to integrate very quickly. Um, in particular, our uh, cardiology platform um, was uh, difficult for us to first engage the vendor, help them understand why we're trying to move to this, um, that at this time we were not planning on moving away from them. Um, so that engagement piece with your, your PAC vendors is very important up front uh, to make them aware of what your plans are and. Um, that your plans are to be able to allow you to have that control of your data. And if they're not willing to do that, why are they not willing to do that? Um, so that was probably one of the largest pieces that we had was that engagement with those PAC vendors. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Doris would like to know if Piedmont is also using EPIC's radiology, cardiology, and pathology apps. So we are currently on EPIC Radiant. Uh, we are using that for both radiology and cardiology, uh, but we are not actually on the Cupid platform, so that's the cardiology-specific one. Um, we are looking at implementing that uh, fairly soon. Um, we are also on a different uh, lab information system, um, so we are using a soft path uh, currently for pathology and, and soft lab obviously for our lab, uh, but we uh, are looking at uh, moving to Beaker, uh, both uh, general lab and uh, AP for uh, EPIC as well. Janet would like to know how you were able to convince senior leadership to commit the funding for such a project. That's, that's a good question. So, you know, one of the things that's always looked at is your return on investment. Um, so that was a big question from our senior leadership is, again, the, the look of this is that it's another layer being added on, another additional cost, and really it was looked at as, why do you want to store this somewhere else and, and cost me more money? Um, one of the biggest pieces for Piedmont in particular was that image enablement of the EMR. Um, we had a, a meaningful use stage two requirement to image enable. We chose that option. And because we did not have a cardiology viewer available, uh, we were actually going to end up costing um, our, our cardiology physicians almost $700,000. So that was a, a very large return on investment immediately that we were able to show that by adding this layer where our, our cardiology PAC system did not have that capability, we can now put this in place and image enable the EMR from a universal viewer. So that was a big ROI for us. Uh, but also for your senior leadership, being able to explain um, the savings cost of migrations. Uh, for every migration that you do, um, it, I, you know, again, your costs may vary for your environment, but they range anywhere from a small migration that may be $10,000 all the way to, uh, in our environment, we've had half a million um, dollar migrations that we've had to do. And having that ability to do the majority of work yourself uh, for especially those smaller ones um, is a large call savings. Also, when you are able to engage your VNA vendor uh, to be able to help you with those, you're really paying professional services at that point. And uh, if you choose the right VNA vendor, those should be lower cost than uh, obviously half a million dollars to, uh, to do migration. So those are two really big ones you can look at. Um, there's a host of other ones um, that are not a pure ROI that you can look at, but obviously from being able to set that foundation to move to another PAC system, move to other viewers, um, has its own uh, qualitative ROI to it as well. Thanks. Um, the next question, how is Piedmont storing and retrieving photos from both internal and external entities, and are the non-EPIC apps stored in the VNA? So I'll address the, the storage and retrieval first. So again, our, our PAC systems are directly storing to the VNA archive um, and are able to retrieve uh, from it. That interface in particular is a DICOM uh, interface, so it, it's standard DICOM storage. Um, we are in the middle of uh, looking at a, uh, our endoscopy system and actually our a new OR um, visualization system in the ORs. Uh, uh, being able to store surgical videos uh, that occur during cases and sending those over via HL7. Um, so the way that that works is that the HL7 message contains the pointer back to the video itself and has that patient demographic information and, and account information. So now the VNA knows who the person, who that patient is, and can pull that video across from the location it was stored and actually store that into the VNA, and then again make it accessible uh, to the EMR through your universal viewer. Um, so that's kind of how we store and retrieve there. For our external sites, um, they currently go through our image exchange platform. Right now we're not actually sending back to any um, providers yet through that image exchange platform. Um, we are retrieving uh, through the image exchange platform and being able to store it um, to different locations, one of those locations being directly to the VNA, and uh, looking at using that for research in particular to store it directly to the VNA rather than uh, starting out sending to our PAC systems. Um, but 
in the future we would be able to, if need be, uh, route certain images um, back to our image exchange platform that may need to automatically go out. So that, that could be a capability if it comes up and we have the need is uh, if there's a certain patient population and there's identifiable uh, markers and tags within the uh, VNA, uh, we can use that information to route it back to an image exchange platform and send that out. And I think there was a question about the EPIC non-applications. Um, so again, we're, we don't, I'm not sure if that question is around the applications themselves. We don't store the application itself in the VNA, um, but any of those applications that I was talking about uh, from all of those other ologies is what we're looking at uh, storing to the VNA. Okay, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the governance around the VNA and um, what determines what goes into it? Sure. Um, our environment does struggle a bit with that one, I will admit. Um, because this started out with an immediate need and, and looking at it from a cardiology viewer perspective for meaningful use and for our radiology storing to it, the governance has really been around uh, or been centered around our uh, radiology and cardiology departments. Um, as we've been expanding, we have already discussed being able to expand that to an image governance council. Uh, which is what we're currently looking at doing. So being able to, at a high level, have an image governance council that can determine where things need to be stored appropriately. Because we are already getting requests in uh, for wound care, for instance, that had already started down a path of storing it to another uh, new system and uh, being able to uh, link that to our EMR uh, via messages coming over from that, that uh, third party system. And that really doesn't um, go well with our, our view of trying to store all of these clinical images in the VNA. Um, so we, it is very important for you to look at an image governance. All right, thanks. Um, Jason would like to know if you're using the VNA to query documents in EPIC. So we're not, we're not querying documents in EPIC, but um, as we move our document management system to uh, be storing to the VNA and, and migrating what's already in our document management system to the VNA, that would be the, um, the layer that would route it back to the MR. So as clinicians uh, bring up uh, the media viewers or like I showed you before, the perceptive desktop that has that um, categorization of each of those, um, as a clinician chooses a document on there, it would do a call to the VNA and the VNA would serve it back. Um, so that's how that would work. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand pulling from the EMR, so maybe if, if you can expand on that, I can, I can answer that more specifically. Um, while he types that, um, can you talk about whether the project was originally conceived as a cost-saving initiative or a patient care-based initiative? It was actually a little bit of both for us. So um, it did start out from that meaningful use space of, of um, a cost uh, perspective. So being able to look at it and say, we're, we're going to lose this money if we don't image enable our cardiology images. So it started there. But as we started looking at solutions and realized what a VNA could do for us, it really did become a clinical um, system at that point. It really was being looked at as, oh, wow, this, this really can do a lot for Piedmont. All right, and the last question I have is, um, do you know the ROI or the forecasted ROI on the VNA? I'm sorry, repeat that question one more time. Do you know the ROI or the forecasted ROI on the VNA? So again, our, our initial ROI was the 700,000. Our projected that we have um, over the course of the expected acquisitions that we have um, and uh, the ability for us to uh, move to other PACS platforms and the savings that we're going to get estimated from a, a decoupled or de-PACS um, environment um, is around two to three million dollars. We're, we're not fully sure yet until we really get into um, choosing that viewer and how much that's going to cost for us, um, but it's already a, from a, a, a three-year savings perspective, uh, once that's fully implemented, about two to three million dollars. Okay, great. Um, well, that was our last question, so we'll conclude the webinar. Um, I want to thank you 
attendees for joining us today and thank you Stephen and Larry for an interesting and informative presentation. Keep an eye out um, for an email from us with links to the recording of the presentation as well as the PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar and wish you a good rest of the day.